one thing I really wanted to do this year was to do a proper full-blown edited ranking video of the Doctor Who festive specials going from Christmas Invasion to Eve of the Daleks. However, I decided to do something way more productive instead and do a review marathon of all of the William Hartnell stories. So that didn't happen, which is annoying because this is going to be the first year since 2005 to not have a festive Doctor Who special. So it seemed like an ideal time to do it. So let's compromise. Instead, what we're going to do is that we're going to do a tier list. I've put one together on Tier Maker um, because despite searching high and searching low, I, ha I struggled to find a tier list that was up to date and had all of the New Year specials. So this has all of them except for Spyfall Part 1 because that's not really festive. That just happens to be an opener that broadcast on New Year's Day. There's nothing really New Year's-y about it. There's also no Feast of Stephen. I apologize. We've got 16 specials from Christmas Invasion to Eve of the Daleks and ranking from um, S, A, B, C, D. So this isn't going to be a proper formal ranking in a, co in a conventional sense this is just going to be me placing them in a tier list so they the, a lot of them will be tied together as well and this is basically just let me try and figure my way through and then if i can edit a proper full-blown edited ranking in the near future i'll try and do that in chronological order we need to start with the christmas invasion which i have no qualms putting in s tier now it doesn't mean that this is necessarily an s tier 10 out of 10 doctor who story but they're being compared to each other so this is an S tier, the best Christmas special. I think that Russell T. Davis and the creative team got it right first time, right out of the gate. Because I think other Christmas specials have been so mediocre and uh, where they basically just think, oh, we need the Christmas Day time slot. Let's just mess around for a bit. Whereas this one is a really fun Christmas themed alien invasion story where you have a rotating Beyblade Christmas tree. Jackie Tyler's I'm going to get killed by a Christmas tree. It's so brave and audacious to have a doctor regeneration story, post regeneration story where he only turns up for the last 10 to 15 minutes in an Arthur Dent style dressing gown after being revived by a piece of, by a cup of tea on Christmas Day. I think that um, Rose Tyler feeling abandoned and feeling betrayed by the Doctor is way more convincing here than it is in stories like Deep Breath for Clara in Series 8. It feels like quite organic and, and good here. I think that it starts really strong. I think the Sycorax are a really good threat as well over the course of the story they are a planet ending or you or like human race ending threat that the doctor is more than capable of wiping out in a few minutes well not wiping out uh, he's able to make them um turn away and run and then harriet jones kills them chase them we need the sycorax back there's actually been a really good seventh doctor and sycorax story on big finish in their classic uh, doctor's new monsters range that that was really good where the seventh doctor gets possessed by blood control but yeah i have no qualms putting uh, the Christmas Invasion in S tier. The Runaway Bride is an interesting one where I don't think it's an especially great Doctor Who story, but in terms of Christmas specials, it is in the top half, I think. I adore the highway chase in the first act. I think it's one of Doctor Who, the revived series' best action set pieces where the doctor's tardis the best ship in the universe is struggling to make it down the a4 and that's just a really great image and the kids at the back of the other car watching telling donna to jump i'm i am flirting with a and b uh, the chat is also kind of on the same level as me because donna for the first few acts is really annoying i did not like Catherine tate in this story it's only looking back retroactively knowing that this is like the start of her character that she becomes a lot more bearable but it's not really until the very end you know especially when lance is revealed to be working with the giant spider I think it's it's not really until then when I think that Donna becomes a, a bearable presence on screen. And I understand that it's Catherine Tate doing what Catherine Tate did best at the time. And she was known as a comedian um, predominantly. So she's the, the fun bride who the Doctor has to get back to the wedding and stuff. But I am sort of flirting between A and B. I think I'll put it in B for now and maybe move it later on. I think that the um the rachnos is a really impressive makeup and visual effect but it just stands there and does absolutely nothing and then it's just the star at christmas that gets shot down by tanks it's a it's there's a lot of pomp and very little circumstance and i also think that making this take place immediately after doomsday and you just have a doctor who's just mourning rose it 
it gets a little bit tiresome until the very end when he uses that passive aggressiveness and that anger to murder the Ragnos' children. That's really good. So I think I'll put it A and B and maybe move it later on. I'm also going to put Voyage of the Damned in the same position. It's a fun spectacle. And I also think that Kylie Minogue is, is surprisingly good. I think when it's trying to do the Poseidon adventure homage... I think that's where it works really, really well. But everything else is kind of a little bit ho-hum. I think the production values are great. The Titanic in space is oddly inspired, I think. Bernard Cribbins has a really cool presence as well. You know, you aliens, don't you dare. Uh, I didn't really believe the Doctor loved Astrid, but I believe that Astrid loved the Doctor. And, you know, that, that goodbye kiss as well. That's, you know, that's a bit of like Hollywood magic, I guess. And they're in the uh, the smart formal wear as well. It feels like Doctor Who goes to Hollywood. And I, I like that vibe. It's the Doctor becoming a Jesus allegory and the angels taking him up at the end with the Murray Gold Choir is so audacious, but I kind of respect it, even though it's really mad. Okay, so for the next Doctor... This was always going to be a bait-and-switch type of story. Obviously, David Morrissey was not going to be the actual Doctor, but even on that level, it's a pretty weak Christmas outing. I like the Victorian Dickensian opening. Uh, you know, what day is this? Oh, why, it's Christmas Day, sir. I like, you know, I like that. It's a cool vibe. I've already reviewed this properly in Cybercember, gone in depth with it. The biggest issue is that once it's established that Jackson Lake is not the next Doctor, he is Jackson Lake, the story loses everything that made the setup so intriguing. The fact that Jackson Lake does not save his son, does not go up in the TARDIS balloon to stop the Cybermen, is basically criminal it's a it's a crime against writing in my opinion setting up this whole um hero's journey for jackson lake and then the 10th doctor just said psych no this is my story now i've already had three christmas specials but damn it i'm not sharing the screen for another one just give me a proper cyber mech shape man. i actually think the visual effects are really strong for it but it is a lot of just cgi effects with very little tangible presence on the story and in the universe that it's set in proper but yeah, you've got Rosita, who has basically nothing to do. I think that the um, the villain, who is so boring, I can't even remember her name. I think Russell T. Davis is just trying really, really hard to write a compelling and memorable female character, but neglects to give her any sort of character. There's a couple of fun lines, like when the Cybermen silently sneak up on the Doctor, and he says, oh, do you have your feet on silent? That's really cool. Uh, the Cyber Shades are right, but they're just a bit throwaway. I like the cyber leader with the brain exposed, but these are all aesthetics here. This is all just vibes. And vibes, unfortunately, do not carry a story like this. This is really weak. This is probably the weakest Tenant Christmas special. Okay, the end of time. I'm in two minds about this because I might also put this in B tier as well. Because everything revolving around the actual plot and the story itself... I could take or leave, really. You know, the master race, the whole uh, Gallifrey returning, the rhythm of four, the white point star, all of that stuff. You know, I could take or leave that. What makes the end of time so memorable and why people like it so much is exclusively because of the scenes between Ten and Bernard Cribbins. And I will not be taking questions at this time. I think, I think that's basically tantamount to a fact in what is otherwise a subjective ranking. That everyone loves the end of time because of David Tennant and Bernard Cribbins, because those two have just such an astonishingly good chemistry with each other, and they are acting at the top of their game. I think that the ending as well, that he goes around and says goodbye to every single companion ever before regenerating, uh, it kind of takes away some of the impact of the Four Knocks scenes, which I, the Four Knocks is... A wonderful scene generally and i know that clever dick films made a persuasive argument about how he doesn't like that scene because it makes 10 look very undignified and ungraceful and like he just seems like he's throwing a tantrum um, I, I meet him halfway on that point but i think that the way it's shot by a ross Lim, how when he gets up from the floor and the reflection is already in the glass chamber 10's reflection is already there I think that's his state of mind. He's already in there. He's just raging at the dying of the light. And he's just... It is, it is almost Shakespearean. 
But the rest of it, the master race, the the bait and switch of, oh, Donna's going to remember. Then all of a sudden, oh, no, it turns out the doctor implanted a mind bomb in her brain as a self-defense mechanism. Oh, that was very convenient of you to do, doctor. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very messy. It's very sloppy. And I also think it's weird to have Timothy Dalton narrate so much of it. It's... It, it's going for grandiose and oddly enough it only kind of reaches grandiose when it's as small as possible dalton great voice there oh no dalton is great as rassilon but he doesn't do anything he turns up at the end of the story wearing the gauntlet and is like oh you'll die with me and then he just gets yeeted by the master the master eating all that food was peak true it is it is camp it is high camp and high art occasionally <laughs> Standy shouty man, yeah. All he's he's the standy shouty rassalon. That's the that's the incarnation. He's not the war rassalon. He's the standy shouty rassalon. Actually, no, that's true though. War the war rassalon is Richard Armitage. He turns up using recycled tortured props, says vaguely threatening things, and leaves. Yep, but he does it brilliantly. All right, let's talk about Christmas Carol. I remember giving this like a five out of ten when I first saw it, and I've not properly revisited it since. I don't. People rave about this one. And I don't quite understand why. I really don't. This is, I think this is a story where um, I might be in the minority here. I think that I, I agree with the chat. It is the best Matt Smith one. But I still don't think it's that good. I think it's trying so hard with the whimsy that it kind of forgets to make the relationship between Kazran Sardik and Catherine Jenkins's character who is so dull that I've forgotten her name they try so hard with the whimsy that they neglect that core romance in the center of the story and I just didn't quite believe it I think the concept is really interesting where the doctor literally Christmas carols a guy where he is the ghost of Christmas past and there's the there's incredible shot where Kazran Sadek is watching a projection of his younger self on screen crying because he can't go out fishing or something and then the the doctor leaves the room in the present and then bam he's now in the past it plays fast and loose with time travel but it earns it thematically like it's okay to sort of bend and tweak the rules of the universe as long as the story itself is interesting and I think that works uh, you're so unbelievably wrong on this man uh, it's not I don't hate it. I just, it just, it, it, it's a story that since broadcast has not vibed with me. I, there's some great bits about it. There's, I think one of my favorite shots of the entire 11th Doctor era is when you've got um, younger, but like teenage young adult Kazran Sadek and he goes back to his drawer to find the half-eaten sonic screwdriver. Murray Gold's version of I'm the Doctor starts playing. The 11th Doctor is at the circular window. That's a wonderful moment. Like, genuinely some of my favourite stuff in, like, the Matt Smith era. Like, that vibe. But the actual story itself, and I think the second half really loses traction. I think it's the second half where you sort of, like, lose the immediate stakes of the story with um, the, the crashing spaceship. It seems like the 11th Doctor is spending so much fun trying to marry Marilyn Monroe where he's kind of neglecting his duty of care towards Amy and Rory. It tries to have it both ways, and I don't think Moffat quite reaches the balance of it. I also think the ending is a little bit underwhelming. Uh, yeah, but it starts really strong. Matt Smith's great in it. I think this is sort of like the transition towards the serious old man in a young man's body to the kookiness of Series 7, but this is like a really good balance in the middle. Like, I'm, I'm going to put this in the middle because if I were to put A Christmas Carol in the C tier, like, it's better than The Next Doctor. And I think it, I, I maybe like it a bit more than I did when I first viewed it. I've not gone back and watched my original review because I will cringe and die. But I can't, in all justification, put this in C tier because that C tier ranking for Matt Smith is reserved for The Doctor, The Widow, and The Wardrobe. A story with weak child actors a weak emotional core 
a plot that meanders for about a good 30 minutes where nothing progresses. You waste Bill Bailey and a bunch of other comedians for a Caves of Androzani callback that amounts to nothing. The opening is cool, where the Doctor's the caretaker of this home, and there's that wonderful scene when he says, you know, you're trying to make the kids happy now because you know they're going to be sad later. That's really cool. And I like the aesthetic of the Christmas present being a portal to this wonderful forest. But apart from that, there's very little to it. The morals at the end are really questionable as well. Like, how did you meet your husband? Oh, he followed me home. He kept stalking me and he wouldn't take no for an answer when asking if I could marry him. It, nah, it was not. It was not it, Chief. There's enough good in it that I can't justify putting this in the bottom tier. But, like, it's it's not as good as Christmas Carol. It's not as bad as the other specials, which are definitely going in this ranking. But honestly, I'd maybe only watch the first act and then turn it off. Can't you make an F tier? It's the bottom tier. So we can make it S, A, B, C, and F. I don't know. F. Tell you what, let's turn this into A tier. Then B, then C, then D, then we go to F. Are you happy now, chat? A, B, C, D, and F. The ending was the best part of that episode. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, I almost forgot because this story ends with him going to meet um, Amy and Roy for Christmas dinner. That's really nice. Chat is never happy. That's true. But I, I try to be the, the peacemaker. It is my gesture to the chat this Christmas, this, me this festive period. But yeah, I forgot about that ending where he meets Amy and Rory and they're in the Christmas jumpers. That's really nice. So that you know, that's kind of it. That that's all I that's all I'll I'll say. Farrow and Blackburn's direction's really cool. I don't like the opening when the um where series six ends with oh you I I got a bit too quiet, Dorian. I got a bit too noisy. I've got to step into the shadows. And then if you watch these stories like in in story order back to back, the very literal next thing the the eleventh Doctor does is blow up a spaceship one of these things is not like the other f is reserved for the next two smith specials maybe not the next two but definitely the snowmen this is an unambiguous f tier this is trash the snowmen is so bad from the story's opener where you've got this kid who's um who's being neglected by the other bullies on the playground and in order to act like he's not strange he starts talking to a snowman it wastes richard e grant it wastes ian mckellen clara's a bit insufferable as a maid who who's basically just been transposed from the future and i like the tardis reveal scene i think matt smith looks cool as an ebenezer scrooge type character but he's not particularly interesting as a character. Go to your room. No, you've been very naughty. No, it's no good. It it's it's shot well. It's got a really strange resolution with the with the tears of the snow and the and with Clara dying and she falls off the cloud because somehow the ice lady got to the TARDIS and it's just it's just one thing after another and it's just really tedious. The Paternoster Gang stuff is not as interesting as it as it likely should be. There's the one word test scene in the Snowmen, which is genuinely one of the most insulting things to come out of the Stephen Moffat era, where Clara says the word pond just because the plot requires her to. And it's just honestly, this felt like a period where Stephen Moffat just delivered a very first draft because he was also working on the 50th anniversary and also Sherlock series three and series four at the same time. He was overworked and stories like The Snowmen are the consequence of that. The Snowmen is Snowmen is, is trash. And then all of a sudden in one scene, the Doctor just turns up wearing Sherlock Holmes garb. Like, it's just references for the sake of references. It, man, I think you're drunk. Only on knowledge. That's, that's what I'm drunk on. The time of the Doctor. For a good long while, this is in F tier. And then the third act happens. And then it moves to D tier. It starts, interestingly, with the message from Trenzalore. And I like thematically the idea of the 11th Doctor just spending his final incarnation on in the town of Christmas, defending the town from everything that may come his way as he tries to defend the crack in time as well, so that Gallifrey does never get the answer to the question, Doctor Who and all. But it is, honestly, just a lot of flippity-jibbity. It is... <laughs> 
it, it's very pretentious and ponderous and I honestly don't really engage with it until Clara returns back to Christmas and Matt Smith is in the old age makeup looking a little bit like William Hartnell. And then there's a really cool regeneration. It made, didn't it make like my top 10 or top 15, like the regeneration of the 11th Doctor into 12? Like I, I, there's some stuff I adore in this story, but it's relegated to like the the last act of the, of the episode of the special. So I cannot in good conscience put it much higher. I would genuinely watch any of these other specials over Time of the Doctor. Like I love Handles. Handles is terrific. But this is once again a uh, weird sexual harassment doctor who is naked when visiting Clara's parents and makes Clara naked as well because the clothes can only be seen by them and the viewer apparently. It's it's very weird and I don't approve. The whole emotional core of Clara's story arc culminates when her grandmother, who we have never met prior to this episode, whose name we don't even know, we we never hear this character's name or see it or anything in any capacity, so this unnamed unknown character just turns up and is like oh clara cheer up you can save the day and then clara just does it it's not it's not it's not it chief the new acts were horrible some of the worst things in his era yeah and it's it's thankfully it's concentrated almost exclusively to series seven so you could you can you can ignore most of it right now we move on to the capaldi era We've got Last Christmas, which, believe it or not, is one of the more recent stories here that I have actually rewatched over the past couple of years. Last Christmas, though, despite having rewatched it quite recently, like I've watched it more recently than Christmas Carol, Doctor Wood and the Wardrobe, and The Runaway Bride. I hardly remember anything about this one. It's the Dream Crabs one, and Santa's in it as well. Nick Frost is totally wasted here as a cool old man's idea of what a cool Santa could be like. Um, Last Christmas is just not... It's not an engaging story. The character who's meant to be, oh, this is going to be Clara's replacement, is a good performance, but the character has, like, basically nothing to her, apart from she sings a Christmas song at one point, and then it's meant to be pretty subversive. The whole Clara deciding to become the companion again at the end does feel forced, and that's because it wasn't meant to be the original ending of the story. It was meant to be Clara... This was meant to be Clara's second departure story, but she changed her mind again and that's how we got to series eight so series eight allegedly was meant to be an entire doctor season with no companion and clara had to be hastily rewritten into several of those stories if those rumors are correct which obviously i cannot properly confirm but yeah so clara just all of a sudden gets a departure here and then is brought back on board to the tardis again you could say it feels forced because it is true the elves that help santa are abominably cringe the dream crabs are a Moffat trying to do Inception, but a really lame and boring version of Inception. Um, yeah, Last Christmas, I don't even have... Uh, sorry, uh, Series 9. I meant Series 9, sorry. I love the alien joke, though. Yeah, there's, a, there's the odd cool line here, but that's about it. And also, isn't Danny Pink in this special as well for, like, a scene? I don't even, like, I don't even remember what happened with that one. Anyway, right, let's go immediately to a good one. The Husbands of River Song. This is B tier. I think that the second act is a little bit wibbly. I think the second act is just a lot of 12 and River running around. But Capaldi and Alex Kingston have genuinely great chemistry with each other. Way more chemistry than Matt Smith and Alex Kingston did. And I, I actually did like the 11 and river song dynamic for the most part i think hydroflax is fun there's a great scene at the beginning when capology just goes fully anti-monarchy but the husbands of river song is it's it's a fun one i also has a really lovely ending it's a it's an ending that goes on for just the right amount of time it's not super a thousand scene long self-indulgent ending like the end of time this this hits the spot this is like the emotional goldilocks of the christmas specials i can't put this up with christmas invasion because that second act really doesn't have a lot to it really but there are some wonderful scenes when the Doctor gets to pretend to be shocked by the interior dimensions of the TARDIS, which is one of my favourite scenes of the revival. I don't have too much more to say here, but I, I really do like The Husbands of River Song. And I think Capaldi and Alex Kingston really do carry it. Greg Davis is fun as well. I didn't like Nardole in this story, though, which is why I was so baffled when for Series 10 they were like, yeah, we're bringing Nardole back as a proper companion. 
uh, yeah, I did not like him here. He wasn't very fun. He wasn't very interesting. I also think he's not that great in The Return of Doctor Mysterio, but he is a marked improvement. I'm, But I am tempted as well to put this in B tier as well. Because Return of Doctor Mysterio, you'll sleep on this, I think. Now, yes, I am ranking Return of Doctor Mysterio above last christmas and the time of the doctor and maybe above christmas carol i'm kind of flirting with like between b and c tier the only reservation i have putting it in b tier is that it's really not that much of a christmas special it just happens to be set at christmas so it may lose some points here but then again i'm also going to have resolution and eve of the daleks and revolution of the daleks and they're not christmassy or particularly festive either but yeah i, I think i might put this i'm still flirting with c or b tier I'll figure, I'll figure it out eventually. Stephen Moffat is not doing interesting superhero subversions, even though he clearly thinks he is. Like, these are jokes that are literally decades old. And I also think that the villains who are able to um, like open their heads up, not that interesting. I will say, though, I do like the superhero love story. It is basic, but it is like Clark Kent, Lois Lane, Superman um hidden identity thing i like the climax of the story i like the the crashing spaceship and 12 and nardola inside the the cockpit as well everything with the baby you know your bomb's gone it's good I, I, yeah there's also the really great shot when um i forget her name she she's the lois lane journalist character she sees the villains going into the big vault and then she goes and hides around the corner and then the camera pulls out and the 12th doctor is there eating sushi so oh no don't mind me carry on i brought snacks i like that a lot are you going to reorder the into the uh tier rankings when you're done maybe but i'm with the exception of Return of Doctor Mysterio and Runaway Bride, I'm I'm pretty happy with this tier so far. Nardor makes a bad first impression with his, oh, can I go to the little boy's room? But he ends it strong with that speech about um, River Song and the ending scene where he starts up the TARDIS again. That's really nice. I liked that a lot. I think I'm going to leave this in C tier. Yeah, I think this is staying in C. It's good. But it doesn't. There's no scene as emotionally impactful as the ending of Husbands of River Song. There's no scene as funny as the Twelfth Doctor going into the TARDIS for the first time. But I like it. I think that this is quite underrated. I think a lot of people sleep on this one. Twice Upon Time. I'm tempted to create its own tier. This is trash. Twice Upon a Time is abominably bad. I think Twice Upon a Time is the worst Christmas special. The only good thing about the snowmen being here is that it looks good in, by comparison to Twice Upon a Time. Twice Upon a Time is awful. Genuinely, genuinely trash. Now, I understand that this was basically written in 30 minutes, which is impressive considering that this is an hour-long plus script. But tw Twice Upon a Time is basically a story where thematically you can read a lot into it about the Doctor growing up and being like cringing at how he used to be. But this is essentially tantamount to character assassination for the first Doctor as well. David Bradley does a good job, but this is not the Doctor. This is not the Doctor. It's not even like sexist cringy first doctor who says it's you know let's get out of here it's all full of arabs from the feast of stephen am i going to say that the first doctor was a beacon of progressivism absolutely not he does actually say at one point you're gonna have a jolly good smacked bottom that's an actual line that he said in the classic series to susan in the dalek invasion of earth how <laughs> at 30 minutes who told you that I, I can i can intuit this i have a sixth sense for shit however this isn't the first doctor like in the first season or the second season when he could be a bit regressive and sexist. This is the first Doctor who is about to regenerate at the end of the Tenth Planet, who has mellowed, who has grown thanks to Ian, Barbara, Susan, Vicky, Stephen, Dodo, Ben and Polly, like Katarina. He has grown as a character. So to see that he spent his final few moments on this Earth before the ending of the Tenth Planet saying, aren't women made of glass? 
smacked bottoms. Like, it's tantamount to a character assassination. It basically feels like Stephen Moffat only watched those cringy scenes, like a, a cringy scene compilation on YouTube, and thought, yeah, that's the first Doctor. But even if the first Doctor was perfectly characterized, the rest of the story is just trash. Testimony is just a blatant copy of the hard drive uh, from Dark Water and Death in Heaven and the alternate um, afterlife and universe at the end of Silence in the Library and Forest of the Dead. It is just, it's just, he's copying ideas from the past. Rusty makes a cameo a return, even though it makes no sense for the Daleks to have a bigger database in the universe than even the Time Lords or anyone else. That He's just been shoehorned in there. Then all of a sudden, oh, it time freezes and then he's, he's zapped out of Trenzalore by testimony. Testimony is boring. Bill was here for basically no reason other than to wax lyrical about the Doctor being a really profound character. And it kind of undercuts... Uh, her departure at the end of the Doctor Falls. I genuinely think that the best and most charitable interpretation of Twice Upon a Time is that it's a really poorly judged fever dream that happens after the Doctor Falls, and it's it's not canon. Also, I got some flack for this on Twitter the other day, but my opinion for this story is partly soured by the environment in which I saw it in. It was Christmas 2017, and I went up to Edinburgh to visit family, and I wanted to watch Doctor Who, because it's Christmas Day, and they all, and they all know that I love Doctor Who and would want, would want to watch The Regeneration, and they wanted to see Jodie Whittaker as well, so we sat down to watch it, and within 10-15 minutes, my family were fucking hating it they were they they knew it was bad and the worst part is is that i knew it was bad and it was my fault they were watching it and i was embarrassed to be a doctor who fan watching it now even if they hated it and i loved it and i knew that they were hating it and i felt guilty you know my opinion and the environment in which i watched this story does not properly really influenced my overall opinion of twice upon a time but the fact that that was my perspective watching twice upon a time and i hated it as well is just really bad icing on the cake to this story this was so bad your family's taste is cringe they didn't like the guitar tank scene uh, actually it wasn't my family who watched the guitar tank scene it was friends who did used to watch doctor who but hadn't, but hadn't watched it for a while uh, friends who were in london and me and um, my um, my now wife then um, girlfriend i don't even think we were engaged at that point um we, yeah we went to visit and we watched the story and they were like oh we've not watched Doctor Who for a couple of years yeah yeah we'll put it on and they were just like dying inside when he rode in on the tank like disgustingly cringe um and people saying blame Chibnall now I can blame Chibnall I guess for the fact that the story had to be written but <laughs> your as of yet married wife nice Chibnall did not make Stephen Moffat write the first Doctor as a character assassination interpretation of the character. Chibnall did not make Stephen Moffat write Clara to have her memory back, thus negating the ending of series 9. Like, Chibnall did not make Stephen Moffat do this, so you can sort of blame him in a principled way, but the end result of the story? Nah, as far as I'm concerned, this is on Moffat's head, because this is all of his worst traits as a writer coming to the forefront. We have the Chibnall Dalek trilogy, and Resolution is going right up to A tier. I enjoy it more than Husbands of River Song. I don't know if I enjoy it as much as Christmas Invasion, but as a fun hour-long block of TV, it's a great Dalek story. It's a fun story for the Doctor and the fam as well. I really, really like Resolution. It's easily the strongest of the Dalek trilogy for Jodie Whittaker. I think that the Dalek is so well and interestingly characterized. The tank scene, uh, surrender, allocated surrender period has expired, consequence extermination is genuinely like poetry. I adore everything about it. I understand the chat is having massive whiplash right now, going from twice upon a time to resolution, and they're in polar opposite tiers, but this is a flag that I'm willing to plant here. I also understand that Ryan's subplot with his dad feels like it's in a completely different story and season and genre from everything happening around him but i think that toss and cole and the actual places that i think that they're selling it really really well i really like that scene in the cafe when um when ryan basically lays into his dad in that i, I really do like that scene i genuinely do 
Um, Yaz has nothing to do, but you know, this is series 11, so that's sort of par for the course. Bradley Walsh is fun. There's that really nice scene between, um, between Ryan's surrogate granddad and his actual dad, and they're talking about what it means and to be a parent. Like, so there's some really good stuff and some really good drama in here, all interspersed with a really great Dalek interpretation. But one thing that really makes Resolution stand out to me is that it is a story about new beginnings. It is a story that really, you know, that commits to the New Year's vibe and the New Year's format, where it's about, you know, a New Year's resolution, so, my, so Ryan's dad decides to turn up and try and make a new start, and yeah, I, I actually did really, really like that, and also 13 really does rock that scarf, I like that a lot. It's got a cool ending as well, like a cool climax with the, with the star going supernova, and the music swells, and Ryan takes his dad's hand, I liked that a lot, I really did. Um, I also liked it a lot more than revolution of the daleks i still think revolution of the daleks is better than most of the festive specials but i am sort of hovering between b and c tier you know what chat because i'm also trying to negotiate with you if i put revolution of the daleks in c tier but move up return of dr mysterio to b tier would you folks hate me and I, I, I really want to know. F tier? No, it's not F tier. It, I would watch Revolution over Runaway Bride, Next Doctor, Doctor Widow in the Wardrobe, Last Christmas. I, yeah, I, I definitely, top of C, you're sleep, <laughs> you, you can't just say I'm sleep deprived whenever I say anything. <laughs> But I think in hindsight, Revolution does not hit as hard as it should because, you know, C Captain Jack Harkness never returned again. There was never any proper resolution between Yaz's relationship with the Doctor. You know, the, the, the main reason to bring Captain Jack Harkness into the story was to have that scene where he says, either you leave the Doctor or she leaves you. And that never properly pays off in Flux or in the 2022 specials. So it is just plot points that are left hanging. The prison break is, you know, it's a cool environment. It's a cool way to start the story, but basically she gets locked up in Shada at the end of series 12, only for Captain Jack to break her out by the end of the first act. And there's also the whole, you know, what would, what, how do you stop the Daleks or stop an alien invasion without the Doctor? Oh, it turns out you don't. You just wait for her to turn up. That's lame. That's Yeah, this is in C tier. I like the Daleks interpretation. I actually think that Jack Robertson is pretty good in this story as well. And I like where they leave the character at the end of the story. Even though Chris Noth is going nowhere near Doctor Who ever again after recent allegations. But uh, yeah, and also, um, and yeah, and Captain Jack is leaves through ADR dialogue. Yeah, I, I, I do like this, but I can't justify putting this in B tier. Wait, that was Sharda? It looked just like Sharda. It's not been confirmed to be Sharda, but two seconds. So that's that's Sharda. A big rock with uh, the prison on the side of it. It looks enough like Sharda. It's Sharda with a redesign. I, it, it can't be a coincidence that it's basically a giant rocky meteorite with buildings jutting out of it, right? Spiritually... It's taking its cues from Sharda. It has to be, even if it's not explicitly named Sharda. Anyway, yeah, there's too much holding it back for me to put it any higher. It's, it's, I think this is on the high end of C tier, but uh, I'm not properly ranking these right now. I, I might save that for another video, but this is, this is in C tier, but it is like a high C tier. It's got some great Dalek action in it. I like the, uh, the idea of Dalek purity and how this one Dalek, like, clawed from, like, back from the dead numerous times and did everything it could to bring the fleet to Earth to invade. And they just, they just kill it, brutally. I loved that. That was so perfectly Dalek. I loved it. Captain Jack does nothing. The fam do nothing. There's that bit when they try and confront Jack Robertson with the psychic paper and everything. And then they're like, oh, gee, gee whiz, <laughs> gee whiz, Rick. <laughs> Saving the world's hard, huh? Yeah, it's 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 not good, but I am, as penance, I am putting Return of Doctor Mysterio a bit higher, which leaves Eve of the Daleks. This is tough because I do think this should be like middle tier, but it is a notable step down from Revolution of the Daleks. This might actually be in D tier, high D tier, but D tier nonetheless, because it's fine. No. It feels so disingenuous to put this in the same tier as the next Doctor and Doctor... Because I preferred this. 
this is tough it's the weakest of the trilogy it's for me eve of the daleks is unquestionably the weakest of the trilogy i admire its um its lack of ambition that sounds like a backhanded compliment but using the time loop with the daleks and the single location and messing around with the time loop concept and but it's it's a time loop that is con um that is contracting as it goes along i like that quite a bit but then you've got nick who is definitely a creepy stalker who somehow like guilt trips this woman into falling in love with him over the course of this new year that's not good i really do that's that's on par with the stalking bit from the doctor the widow and the wardrobe except at least the doctor the widow and the wardrobe made it like a little third act weird questionable eyebrow raising detail whereas eve of the daleks like is a bullhorn like really making it a big part of that third act there's too much time loops in it true yeah too many <laughs> eight out of ten too many time loops this is yeah this if revolution is like high c tier then eve is like low c tier it's like at the bottom of the c tier that's not what happened that's absolutely what happened like because um ashley b's character has less than no interest in nick from the very beginning of the story that first scene where he drops that stuff off is she she detests him then they have a couple of scenes together she rejects him he dies and then she likes him again she's guilt tripped into liking him it's so bad i feel like i can't put eve in d but i can't put revolution in b right we're expanding the tier i've been guilt tripped into it uh add row below so this is the new F tier. This is the E tier. Bam. 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 I think I'm happy with that. Yes, you did it. I win. <laughs> yeah, I guess you did. Plot armor. Yes, I plot armored myself out of this scenario. So, F tier. Twice Upon a Time in the Snowmen. E tier. Last Christmas. The Time with the Doctor. The Doctor, the Wood, and the Wardrobe. D tier. Eve of the Daleks and the Next Doctor, C tier, the most cramped tier, Revolution of the Daleks, A Christmas Carol, The End of Time, Voyage of the Damned, The Runaway Bride, B tier, Return of Doctor Mysterio, and The Husbands of River Song, and A tier, Resolution, and The Christmas Invasion. I'm going to say definitively, Christmas Invasion is the best, Twice Upon a Time is the worst. Now that I've expanded the tier... I might put no. I'm ha I, you know what? I'm happy with this. The only question mark I've got is the return of Doctor Mysterio. But I feel like I think yeah, maybe. I I can't justify putting Eve in the same category as Doctor the Widow and it's in the yeah, but it feels it feels in the right place being with the next Doctor. Okay, Bad Wolf Archives is going to be mad. Let them come. The snowman is underrated by no one. This works. I would just shuffle them around within each tier. Yeah, I think if I were to do this properly, I'd... Yeah, no, yeah, this should be in B. I'm happy with that. You need to correct the snowman, please. No, I am, a, I am more than happy with the placement of the snowman. It's not as bad as Twice Upon a Time, but it's still pretty abominable. Snowman is B tier. I, no, I refuse. No way is snowman better then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten other stories. Be reasonable. Snowman is abominable, you say. I didn't even mean we outrank you by numbers. You have to listen. No, actually, there's to be fair, there's like 130 people watching. This is true. I am outnumbered. You can always like crowd me. Twice upon a time is S tier. I am not having this discussion. I am not doing this, folks. Besides, is allergic to quality. No, no. What happened to the season of generosity? <laughs> crowd him no this is the chat invading mr tardis's home from, from, from world war z and that's me that's me watching on as you're, as you're crowding me so i'm i'm honestly quite happy with that tier list now I, the return of dr mysterio is not a hill that i'm willing to die on but i'm happy with it being in that placement if I were to do a proper ranking in the near future, which I might try and do, I may even do it in like June and just like poke fun at the fact that I'm so late to the party. 
But the fact that we're not getting a Doctor Who festive special this year for the first time since 2005 is quite sad. But, you know, we've got an entire massive back catalogue to go through. But Christmas Invasion and Resolution are, like, the top-tier ones for me. Those are the ones that I can pop on at almost any time and enjoy. And some of the more festive ones, like husbands of river song and christmas carol yeah i can pop them on um, i can pop them on at christmas and have a good time so i might try and do a proper edited ranking in the near future but just for now this is this is where it stands <laughs> i think you should start again mr tyler has been doing good this time the chat is savage the ch <laughs> you you lot are savage right now <laughs>